this afternoon on inequality in Brazil. It's a pleasure to welcome you here. We've got a wonderful group of uh, faculty and, and friends from, uh, from Brazil here to join us on a rainy Friday afternoon. I think uh, we may be getting some late arrivals. Our people have just, uh, less courageous people have not braved the elements. Uh, we'll see which is the, which of those is the, is the right uh, uh, hypothesis there. But I, my name is Tom Trebet. I represent uh, the Columbia University Global Center in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. It's very warm and sunny most of the time. Uh, uh, and uh, I, it's my pleasure to present uh, to be, the get the conference proceedings rolling, but I'm going to do this in partnership with uh, those who manage our global center operation right here in New York City. Uh, we have 10 global centers around the world, I think most of you know. Uh, one, uh, one in Rio, but nine, uh, another nine around the world. And I'd like to uh, introduce a, a good friend of ours who helps us to organize the programs here in New York. It's Linda Amro, Linda from our programs department here in New York, who is an international human rights specialist. And she'll give you a few introductory remarks to the topic and to the day. And then I'll come back on it and, and introduce our speakers. Welcome, one and all. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming out today. I know that it's a Friday, it's the beginning of spring, and we really appreciate you coming. We had 150 RSVPs and we actually had to shut down registration. So um, I'm really happy that you all made it all you all made it out today. Just a little bit about myself. I'm the program officer here at the Columbia Global Centers in New York. And it's an honor to put on programming on such uh, important issues like the one we're going to be talking about today. I was brought to talk a little bit about my experience as a human rights attorney and immigration attorney. I primarily served in the Bronx during the Trump travel ban, so I have a little bit of a context as to what it means to not have access to basic human rights. But instead of centering it around myself, I really wanted to take a moment to center it around the person who would most, who is most deserving of it. And that is Marielle Franco. She as many of us in this room know, it was at the epicenter of what it means to have compounded, marginalized, intersectional identities. She is a black, queer woman, a single parent, born and raised in the favelas, who put herself in the limelight even though she knew full well the risks of shaking the table. And she herself said, to be a black woman is to resist and survive all the time. She is a magnet for what it means for activists around the world to put themselves in the forefront. Over 50% of Brazilians identify as black or mixed race, yet most of the politicians are white men. As the only black woman who, among 51 council women, she was a symbolic figure for minorities and saved no efforts to criticize police brutality and the high murder rates in poor neighborhoods in Rio de Janeiro. So she very much was a symbol of hope to the marginalized communities, and her death really hit home to the Afro-Brazilian women who suffer from a lot of the violent, racist, sexist um, rhetoric that is happening in our modern world. But that is what her identities represent. I also want to highlight all of the things that she did accomplish during her short tenure as a councilwoman. As a member of the city council, in her 15 months, she presented 16 bills that revolved around the rights and quality of life for women black people, and the LGBTQ community. Her projects were dedicated to raising awareness about sexual violence, empowering the black population, and developing housing assistance for low-income families. She made it clear that we can't talk about what needs to be done. It needs to be done. She, she, she put the rubber to the road, as they say. So I'm here today, as we all are today, to talk about these different intersectionalities and how important they are, and to also honor her and her legacy. Because the collective vision for liberation is not necessarily trans, is, is necessarily transnational. Our struggles are all inherently interconnected. This goes beyond Brazilian. This goes beyond the borders of Brazil. This is a human issue. This is something that we're all so deeply connected to through our different identities. On the night of her death, Marielle quoted Audre Lorde saying, I am not free while any woman is unfree even when her shackles are very different from my own. And it's with that that I'd like to set the stage for this very important conversation that will have all the different um, lenses through inequality is viewed and intersectionalities in which we view them. Though her voice was silenced prematurely, 
We honor her today by continuing her work and elevating these conversations. Marielle Presente. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to welcome you. for the very appropriate uh, uh, homage. Uh, it's also 51 years uh, to yesterday uh, since the death of Martin Luther King, so this is a very important part of the time of the year. And let me not delay the, 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 uh, our honored guest by, by, without too much background, but it's often asked us what in the heck happened in Brazil. Uh, maybe just a few quick facts to bring us, I think most people have a good awareness, but just to bring us up to, uh, to speed. Brazil always a country of great income inequality, and as well as racial inequality, and other uh, aspects of inequality. Uh, uh, in a, in a, uh, an unequal country in a notoriously unequal part of the world. Recent data suggests that not only is the Gini coefficient very, very high in Brazil, the main side, the richest 1% of Brazilians receive 27% of the national income, so that's high by even by U.S. standards, which is which is saying something. But for a brief period of time, uh, a pro -peer, a pro poor form of growth seemed to take hold in Brazil. That would be in the early uh, for a brief period of time in the early 2000s, Brazil appeared to have found the path to equalizing growth. The economy picked up, maybe under the influence of commodity prices. Uh, the uh, income of the poorest of the poor rose at China-like level, something like 7 to 10 percent annually. The income of favela dwellers, residents of the Northeast, uh, and Afro-Brazilians also appeared to be growing at very, very rapid rates. But by 2012, very telescopically, that uh, period of virtuous growth in Brazil seemed to peter out, and a great deal of discontent uh, soon arose throughout Brazilian society. In itself, after 2012, this was discouraging enough, yet two significant developments dealt additional blows. The first was a period of deep political and economic uh, unrest and ec combined with economic recession, which had an outsized effect on the poor in Brazil. 2016, um, seems like yesterday, uh, marked the depths of the Great Recession, I'll call it, in Brazil, with surges in unemployment, bankruptcies, and a reversal of previous trends of reducing extreme poverty and improving the distribution of opportunities as well as income. The then president in 2016, Jim Mosafi, was removed via an impeachment process and a new government took over, her then vice president, though that government in 2016 was almost immediately submerged in a, in a corruption scandal of its own, which limited its effectiveness to very much that of a caretaker government. So that was sort of the one, one blow that in 2018, at the end of 2018, an even harsher blow landed, and that was, as Linda has already referred to, uh, a new government elected on a pledge to reverse decades of Brazilian economic and social policy, um, a government very much in line, or at least the head of the government very much in line, down to Twitter messages uh, from the president, an angry, hateful rhetoric, everything except orange hair, I say. Uh, very much in line with the Trump administration after which it models itself. Uh, uh, so that is sort of sets the stage for where we are now. This new government has only had three months in office. There are many people who voted for this new government who didn't buy its, uh, its rhetoric uh, whatsoever and, and human rights, but there was sort of a, a general feeling in Brazil of burning down the house, that the country was underachieving, underperforming, for so long that big change was needed, and Jair Bolsonaro, the new president, seemed to be, of the two candidates who survived the grueling uh, 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 election se electoral season, he seemed to be one who would embrace the greatest change. So there we have it, a great period of uncertainty, Brazilians following Twitter messages, uh, headlines, uh, uh, discussions in Congress, Brazilian institutions reacting, uh, the government settling in, attempting to do so, uh, so it's a, well, the best one can say, uh, and this is the way I prefer to look at Brazil, is in very interesting times. So we have to understand that, and we'd like to do it through the lens of inequality, and luckily, I don't have to do it, because we have wonderful people uh, with us, uh, first from the Columbia faculty, and then visitors from Brazil, who, who uh, provide you with a lot of elements, uh, I think, in different perspectives on this broader issue of uh, 
of inequality. I'm going to introduce him very briefly. I know they'll forgive me for the brevity of the introduction. They certainly deserve um, um, uh, honor for all they've accomplished and all they are accomplishing for Columbia. But we'll start with three faculty addresses, and they'll be about 10 minutes each. So pretty quick, uh, just to create impressions come from different, uh, different uh, fields of study, uh, but just to collect some uh, their, their chief thoughts on the subject. And then we'll go to the two, our two visitors from Brazil who will be introduced in turn. Uh, our three professors, uh, in our order in which they'll be speaking on my program anyway, uh, is first is Amy Chaskell. Welcome, Amy. She is a professor of history, a specialist in urban studies, uh, uh, um, uh, was long looked at Brazil on issues of uh, crime and justice, policing, slavery, uh, abolition. Uh, so we have an historian's perspective uh, on inequality. We're very happy to have Amy as to welcome her to the Columbia community. Uh, after a period of time at one of our neighboring institutions here in, in New York City. So welcome, Amy. Then we'll go to Professor Valerie Bertie Greenaway, a close friend, uh, and I'm, happy, I'm proud to say that, of the Columbia Global Center uh, and the Global Centers in general. So Val Valerie, thank you very much for being with us. Valerie um, is the Director of the Laboratory for Intergroup Relations and the Social Mind. That's something very interesting to understand, for us to try to understand. She's a professor uh, of psychology, her uh, uh, Valerie is a global view. So, as, our, as the title of our event suggested, we'll be looking at global perspectives of inequality. But she is also familiar with Brazil and has recently honored us by giving keynote addresses at a very important conference on gender issues and gender bias. Uh, she came to be with us in Rio. Thank you for that. We'll move to Valerie second. The third will be our another close friend, <laughs> yeah, Rodrigo Suarez. Uh, uh, who was an economist. His formal title is Lemon <coughs> Professor of Public Policy uh, and International Affairs here at the uh, right next door at SIPA. He is our first professor, the, the, some of the folks in the room may correct me, but I think in the history of Colombia, whose, whose appointment is in, in honor of the studies of Brazil, and, and Rodrigo has gotten that, started that new tradition off in a, in a very encouraging way. So thank you for being with us, Rodrigo. Uh, the three will speak first, then I'm going to, but I want to at least mention, uh, without leaving them without mention for too long, uh, they will be followed uh, to the podium uh, by two friends uh, from uh, Brazil, Mileni Ramos, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Mileni Ramos is a graduate of this very school here, uh, the School of Law. She's an LLM from uh, Colombia, studied elsewhere as well. For many years, a judge in the labor court justice system in Brazil, which she'll tell us a little bit about. Um, she's an activist in women's issues, racial issues. Um, she's been a uh, um, participant in one of our most important programs at the Columbia Global Center, which is on building uh, a, uh, a women's leadership program network in Brazil. Thank you, Milene, for coming from Sao Paulo to be with us. And then finally, uh, Anderson França is with us today, too. Anderson, it's been a pleasure to have you around the university, to be with you, to meet you in person. Anderson is a social activist, he's an educator, um, he is uh, a, a member of uh, an opposition political party uh, who has, uh, I think for that reason, has come under a great deal of pressure, as you can imagine, in Brazil today. So Anderson now finds himself uh, living in Portugal, uh, and I'll ask him to tell you a little bit more about his life and his background and as he gives us his message today later, later on in the uh, event which, by the way, he'll be speaking in Portuguese, and I'll provide a running translation, and then and I will team, team tag uh, to provide a running translation, but he'll tell us a little bit about his life uh, and his commitment. Uh, one, of them, uh, one of the most interesting aspects that, uh, of Anderson's work is something called the Universidade da Correria, which means the University of Running After Things, which means it's a, it's a way to teach entrepreneurship in, uh, in progress communities on the periphery of Rio de Janeiro. But such work is not popular uh, nowadays, and Anderson is part of the reason I think Anderson is now not living anymore in Brazil. Well, that's too much for me. I'm very sorry. Um, uh, and so, same mind as you mean. I'm going to go to our three faculty members in order, and then there'll be a little bit of a break, and we'll call up our two visitors from, from Brazil. We'll start with Professor Chaskel. So 
thank you very much for the introduction and um, thank you for your amazing introduction to the, to the event. Um, and thanks to Tom Chabot and uh, Teresa Borges who couldn't be here today from the Rio Global Center for the invitation to be here today. Um, and having just started at Columbia, I'm heartened and delighted by the university's support for the study of Brazil and to and its openness to discussion of its pressing issues, even its difficult and painful ones. And I want to apologize because I'm going to have to leave um, early before today's event is done, just so no one thinks I'm evading questions or <laughs> anything like that. Um, but I want to say that it's really an enormous honor for me to be on the program today with such distinguished and inspiring people. Um, and I really hope, unfortunately, since I have to leave, it won't be today, but I hope for other chances to engage with you in broad discussions about questions of inequality and other areas of common interest. So I was invited to start off the conversation today um, by contributing about 10 minutes of commentary on the subject of inequality in Brazil. Now, this is certainly not a simple task from my vantage as a historian gazing back over five centuries and over Brazil's vast territorial expanse. Speaking about inequality in any context is a daunting task, in large part because it's not just one thing. It could imply a division along the lines of gender, race, class, or ethnicity, or of sexual orientation, religion, generation, and age, and so on. When we study inequality, what should we prioritize? And what should we subordinate? Is it possible to isolate one kind of inequality from the others, even heuristically and temporarily for the point of studying it? The contemporary idea of intersectionality echoes something that has long been common sense, um, a common sense idea in historical research, that forms of social difference and exclusion are inextricably connected to one another. The discipline of history is also so very central to the study of inequality because historians are fundamentally allergic to static categories. What history does so well is to show that the very categories that sort people into haves and have-nots are not inherent or organic in the world. They have themselves been invented. What is at issue in thinking about inequality is not only or mainly the maldistribution of resources and social power, of political voice and of legal leverage. The real problem is how that unequal distribution is reproduced over time, forming social imaginations and expectations, conditioning the way people govern and submit to rule, and the way people coalesce into families and communities and whom they include and whom they exclude as they do. So history is really useful for the study of inequality, and the past has been used and also abused. The histories of colonial and even post-colonial Brazil have long dragged with them the weight and even the tragedy of its immutably hierarchical social structure. Um, Iberian, and in this case, the Lusso version of colonialism has often been understood as the foundational moment that built the basis on which Brazilian society and political culture were formed. And I, I think a whole lot about the waxing and waning of interest, for example, in the study of the old regime, the ancient Beyonce regime, um, marked by extreme social hierarchy. And historians have shown that the very idea of the old regime was only really invented in the 19th century as part of a generation of thinkers, of post-colonial thinkers, forcefully attempting to distance themselves from the recent absolutist past. The idea of the old regime then, again, gained even more traction in the 20th century as scholars who tried to root out persistent traces of what they saw as feudalism in their contemporary world. Um, Brazilian colonial society was indeed heterogeneous and deeply and explicitly stratified. In it, we can see the development of racialized ideas that buttressed and grew along with hierarchical society hierarchical society, ideas like 
the doctrine of purity of blood, and of course the idea of race as it emerged from the experience of slavery, among other things. Social hierarchies were reinforced every day in ways large and small. Um, just for one example, the documents that the Portuguese crown issued to establish norms for the overseas empire made specific reference to sumptuary restrictions on telling people what fabrics they could wear and so on, what outward displays they could use when they walked around in the streets, and made specific reference to the skin color of colonial subjects and devoted entire chapters to con the controlling what they would wear and um, specifically for blacks and mulattoes in the conquistas, the word that was used in the documentation of the Portuguese empire for the overseas colonies. Um, but of course, modern inequality has not simply been a direct consequence of colonialism. And as a historian of the 19th century, um, this is largely what I, what I study, the way in which the post-colonial legal system reproduces um, social inequalities, despite a liberal, 19th century liberal commitment to the inequality of everyone before the law. And this is especially poignant with regard to racial inequality and its long trajectory. Um, race is certainly one of the most, if not the most, dramatic example of the invention of categories. Um, it is the result of an active process, and I think, um, I always think back to the word racecraft, to borrow the language that was used um, by the historian Barbara Fields and her co-author Karen Fields in their brilliant work on race in the United States. There are no distinct entities like black and white as they show in their, in their prolific work. These categories come out of a constant collective project of social imagining and from the political and legal structures that grow out of that. So we historians, historians in Brazil and historians of Brazil, can expose the deep roots of multiple interlocking forms of inequality. What's more, we can proffer evidence from the archive to coax us away from thinking that social, racial, gender, and economic inequality is a sort of genetic disease programmed into Brazil's DNA, that inequality is simply the inheritance of Portuguese colonialism, thus essentially letting the entire population of the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries off the hook. And if there is an important deep history of inequality to be uncovered in Brazilian history, there's also a deep history of egalitarianism to be told. Um, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but for example, um, the 19th century liberalism contained ideas, um, the liberal constitution passed even in 1824, claimed and asserted that the law shall apply equally to all. Now in practice, unsurprisingly, free persons of color never fully enjoyed these political and civil rights, of course, to say nothing of enslaved people. Um, yet the legal arguments were there in place to be leveraged, and leveraged they were. And in the 20th century in Brazil, people were granted social and economic rights um, and later, such collective third-generation rights as the right to the city and cultural rights, collective rights that are not even dreamed of in the United States. Um, so in ending here, I want to cite way too briefly the example of Lumbi Palmares, an example that anyone who's familiar with Brazil will know, um, to illustrate the immense complexity of racial inequality as embedded in the web of other inequalities in Brazil's history. So the existence of quilombos, and this is gonna be very old hat to anyone who knows Brazil, but I'm gonna go over it quickly anyhow. Um, quilombos, fugitive slave communities, characterized all of Brazil during the colonial period and right through to the end of the 19th century when slavery was abolished. These, collect these collectives generated racially inflected fears and, and lots of very draconian laws to try to keep them under control. Um, they occasionally even engaged the Portuguese and later the Brazilian independent government um, and private landowners in warfare and also in treaty making. 
The most iconic example is the quilombo called Palmares, a confederacy of tens of thousands of formerly enslaved inhabitants and their descendants believed to have, have existed for nearly all of the 17th century in what's today Alagoas in northeastern Brazil. In the middle of the 20th century, much of Latin America experienced a revolutionary moment. Revolutionary movements redistributed wealth and especially land um, earlier in Mexico, of course, with the Mexican Revolution, but then in Bolivia, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Ecuador, Peru, and of course Cuba. To varying degrees, these countries implemented land reform, breaking up massive estates, nationalizing private wealth holdings, and so on. Now, this type of redistributive agrarian form would never take place in Brazil. The country was arguably on the brink of, of a move, in the, of such a move in the early 1960s, around the time of this revolutionary wave, but the coup in 1964 that instituted over two decades of military civilian dictatorship essentially shut down that possibility. But the story doesn't end there. In the period of opening, after the end of dictatorship, tireless political organizing and activism by the black movement in Brazil led to the framing of cultural rights in a way that would recognize the descendants of these fugitive slave communities, Himana Sanchez, Jiquilombos, um, and under certain conditions to grant them title to the lands that they inhabit in Article 68 of the Constitution of 1988. Um, a right that was kind of, that was so pioneering that no one knew how to implement it yet. Um, Brazilian cities began to pass legislation to recognize Black Consciousness Day, and um, again, I'll skip over a lot of these details that most people in here know, but in 1995, there was a 300 year anniversary of Zumbi's death and this great awakening of interest. Um, and then finally, this idea of actually titling land uh, to, to the descendants of Quilombos would, would be gone. In a 2003 law made the teaching of Afro-Brazilian and African history and culture compulsory in schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. But the teaching of Afro-Brazilian history, and along with other inequalities such as gender, has become a lightning rod of controversy in Brazil's right wing, uh, emerging right wing generated culture wars. The 2003 law mandating Afro-Brazilian history is now at risk. Bolsonaro's Minister of Education published new guidelines for school textbooks that, ex that excluded culturas quilombolas. And this move could have to do with land titling as much as it may have to do with racism and disdain for the descendant communities of runaway slaves. And now, less than a month ago, a federal court just upheld the southern city of Porto Alegre's decision to do away with the Gia da Consciencia Negra, Black Consciousness Day, as an official holiday. So that's where we are right now. Um, before we can understand and combat inequality, we need to understand its historical trajectory, not just as a long, unbroken colonial legacy. We also need to understand the history of the idea of both inequality and egalitarianism as a value and as a practice, formed through a contested process that has unfolded and that continues to unfold. Thank you. from Colonial Era to uh, what happened uh, last month in Porto Alegre. But thank you very much. I think Linda, you need to put, and then uh, I'm going to maybe turn over while Linda puts your presentation up. Welcome, Professor Valerie Ferdi Greenaway. It's a pleasure to have you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to try to is that I know actually very little about um, Brazil. This is the beginning of my intellectual journey. I am a social scientist. I am a psychologist. Um, I'm here with my postdoctoral uh, fellow whose research I'm gonna share, uh, George, uh, from Rio. And uh, as 
we have joined for forces. We have come to uh, spend a lot of time thinking about uh, inequality, both in the context of intersectionality and women of color, both here in the United States and in Brazil, as well as the broader experiences of, of inequality. Um, and so this is my uh, laboratory right across, this is right across the street, as well as the laboratory at B BGB with uh, Eduardo Andrade, who's also a big part of this research project. Um, to start, uh, when we were sort of thinking about how to enter the experience of understanding intersectionality, the experience of women of color, both in Brazil and in the United States, um, what's actually uh, very, very different from the, the wonderful presentation that you heard earlier is that social psychologists try to isolate variables. Rather than thinking about the sort of rich history, we try to sort of, uh, sort of parcel out what is actually causing what. And we started this idea of just sort of trying to understand the very brief lay of the land and whether we could even think about comparing the experiences of women in the United States to the, women, the experiences of women in Brazil. This is a survey from the Global Trend Survey showing looking at the prevalence of stereotypes. And what you can see is that uh, we actually have a lot more in common than uh, what distinguishes us. When you look at the uh, item that the role in society of women is to be good mothers, the uh, statistics for Brazil and the US are uh, comparable. About 43 uh, and 41% res respectively endorse this. When you look at the question, um, things would work better if more women held positions with responsibilities of, of government communities, 69% uh, endorse that in Brazil compared to 57%. But when you look at the role of women in society to be good mothers and wives, again, it's 43 or 41%. And so when we look at this, the, the sort of third and, and, and last findings sort of suggest that when you look the world over, we still have a long way to go. Women uh, wind up occupying a very constrained number of uh, positions, education, healthcare, hospitality, food, and beverage. And many of the uh, uh, industries below, we do not. And so this sort of gives us a very quick snapshot of the experiences of uh, women in Brazil and in the United States, the kind of stereotypes that uh, are endorsed about them. But then what I wanted to do was sort of, um, our starting point em empirically was to separate the experiences of women and try to just isolate what we can understand about inequality. And so what we know is that there are so 700 uh, million living in uh, socio uh, low socioeconomic conditions. Uh, comparatively, there's 40 million Americans are estimated to live in poverty, but just in Rio de Janeiro alone, uh, a quarter, 25% of the uh, inhabitants live uh, in the favelas. And so this is very much George's uh, experiment that tried to understand the experience of, of inequality, and in particular in the context of trying to uh, 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 try to uh, get along. And what we try to argue is we try to compare the kinds of studies that are done by economists that look specifically at price. And we tried to compare it to what we do as psychologists is to understand the psychology of the person who's in a low-income community, who's in the favelas, and try to understand what their experiences are. And we try to pit those two against each other. And when you look at standard uh, economic theory, what they argue is that low-income consumers are concerned about price. And what that means is that uh, when they are in need of resources, what they'll do is they'll search for the cheapest option. They just want the, the cheapest thing no matter where it is, where, no matter where they have to get it from. But what psychologists argue is that not only um, when you're contending with being low income are you concerned about money, but also your identity. And that people who are, are low income are uniquely sensitive to racial bias as well as just having to uh, deal with the challenges of money. Um, so for example, this is an example that almost all of you are familiar with. Um, here are two individuals, this is here in the US, two black men are in Starbucks, they're simply trying to get a cup of coffee, um, and they have a completely different set of experiences that they encounter. And so we were saying to ourselves, well, if it's the case 
that individuals who contend with very low income are also concerned about their identity, that maybe they wouldn't just always seek, uh, seek out the cheapest option. Maybe they would seek out options that are sort of going to make them feel psychologically safe. So that's, that's the entry point of this program of research. And so the, 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 what we call this as psychologists is that if you are in a situation where you're concerned about your identity, then you are concerned about social identity threat. Your identity is vulnerable. And we hypothesized or we thought that for low-income individuals, specifically living in the favelas, that they would have these greater concerns about identity threat. It has nothing to do with living in the favelas. Actually, the studies that I'll show you here were replicated in Harlem. It has to do with the concern about the value of your identity as you move outside of the favelas or also uh, in Harlem. So what we so um, to skip this. So oh, I see this is a different one. Okay. So what we did is that we um, uh, decided to conduct an experiment, and in this experiment we were in uh, Mare. And, uh, and uh, this is a study where uh, George paired up with uh, an NGO there, built a laboratory in the uh, favelas, and, and used very low-income, low-income individuals. And uh, the idea is that they were asked uh, uh, to imagine that they were interested in seeking a loan. So regardless of the experimental condition, they were always interested in seeking a loan. And the outcome that we were interested in is where they would like to open their bank account. So what we did is that we gave them a choice. So what happens is in this experiment, they are told, regardless of condition, that you always have one option. One option is that you can uh, seek a loan and this loan would be uh, uh, you know, sort of a small micro, micro loan, so translating the amounts for you, so it would be a, approximately $12, and it's close to you, it's in your neighborhood. Or, in this non-identity threat condition, in this identity safety condition, we say, you know what, or you could go to another bank, it's still in the favelas, it's still in your neighborhood, but it's 20 minutes away. So the idea here is that it, this really shouldn't matter, it's just really just a matter of distance difference. What we compare this to is a second experimental condition. And in this condition, we said, look, you can seek this loan. It's a little bit more money. It's $12. It's in your neighborhood. Or you can also just walk 20 minutes away. You can seek a loan. It's cheaper, but it's in a different neighborhood. It's in a wealthier neighborhood. And the attendants and the staff uh, are from wealthy uh, neighborhoods, and that's where they're from. So the idea here is that uh, participants are pre presented with a choice. And the way to understand this is that there's one set of participants, they only see this choice. There's another set of participants, they only see this choice. And what we're interested in is if it's a question of just price sensitivity, then what you should always do is you should always get the cheaper price. Right? You should get the cheaper price regardless of the neighborhood that it's in. If there's something about the identity that a person has and uh, that from contending with stereotypes, bias, microaggressions, prejudice, then what should happen is you should actually seek something that's a little more expensive, but it's in your neighborhood, rather than something that's a little less cheaper, but it's in a wealthier neighborhood. So that was the question that we were interested in. So in order to try to measure this sense of people's identity, their attachment to the favelas in the neighborhood, we also measure just how much do you care about your ethnic group, how much do you care about your identity in uh, items like this. So what did we find? So we, what we found is that if you, the, the white bars here are the comparison of the individuals where they make the choice between $12 and $10, but they're in their neighborhood. They're always in the favelas in money. The black bars are what we're calling the intergroup condition. You're comparing whether it's you staying in your neighborhood for $12 or 
moving to the wealthier neighborhood for $10. And the question of, of interest is always, what percentage of people are going to choose the cheaper loan? So higher numbers means a greater percentage of people. So what, if, what we're looking here is that our hypothesis that suggests that identity matters and this, these concerns about discrimination matters, our hypothesis stands and the economist uh, position tends to be discounted. So specifically what we find is that for individuals who are not so worried about their identity, they are sort of low in what we call identity vulnerability, they're not really thinking about their identity with respect to the novella, it doesn't matter. They either, they're equally likely to choose the bank that is the cheapest. So this is what the economists would predict. What we find is, um, this is the piece that's really interesting. What we find is that for those individuals that are high in what we call identity vulnerability, they're concerned about stereotypes, prejudice, those sorts of things, what happens is they are significantly more likely to say, hey, I will pay more money, I'll pay $12 for the loan so that I can stay in my own neighborhood. So you would think that people shouldn't do this, right? Because they're actually spending more money for the same thing in order to stay in their own neighborhood. So this is just one slide we read several of these. They've been replicated in Harlem as well. And where we're going with this is that we're interested in trying to now combine the experiences of women with the experiences of the, the experience of being very low income to try to understand women of color uh, comparing Brazil and the US, specifically looking at formal and informal economies. And the closing thing that I want to share is that what we are arguing for is that we need to sort of include when we're thinking about inequality, not just these arguments about economic rationality, what is rational for individuals that are low income. What we need to think about are things like identity, concerns about prejudice, concerns about discrimination, because what we're showing is that that actually tends to have a more powerful effect on the kinds of decisions that they're making around income, and we know that money is incredibly important in terms of thinking about the future of inequality and how to mitigate it. So with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that, uh, Professor Freddie Greenaway. It's like to have you with the, uh, see the important results of comparing uh, Black identity and racial prejudice in Harlem and in the favela in Amare in Rio de Janeiro. So we we'll hopefully see further results of that uh, over time. And right now to welcome our, our colleague uh, Rodrigo Suarez, uh, an expert on social policy, to uh, uh, offer his remarks. Welcome, Rodrigo. Thank you, Tom, for the invitation. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, so Tom asked me to talk a little bit about, uh, I think, perspectives of. Uh, Something will pop up here. I don't know. So, um, so Tom asked me to talk a little bit about, the, I guess, the perspectives of social policy and social policy to fight inequality today in in Brazil. So I think I'm going to be very brief and, and not very structured. So I'm not going to have uh, slides. Uh, my my initial idea actually was to give kind of a more kind of historical background of the last 50 years of social policy in Brazil, 40, 50 years, that I think uh, there were a lot, there was a lot of progress, a lot of progress related to reduction in inequality management. And I mentioned maybe the income being the, the, the one where we saw least progress actually, but I don't bother I mentioned there was a lot of progress. And from there, have, I, I had planned on having a broader discussion, and I have actually even prepared a couple of, of figures, but in Brazil nowadays, uh, reality poses uh, itself <laughs> anew, right? So after reading two days ago about the, the president's remarks related to, the, to the, the way that the Census Bureau, the IBGE, the Brazilian Census Bureau, calculates the, the, the employment rate, that the president raised some suspicions about it, I thought that, oh, what the hell, let's just forget about that. Let's go just jump to the, what I think is really uh, 
the main, I think, challenge to public policy, not only social policy, I think, to social policy relations to the class, but to pol public policy more generally today, not only in Brazil, but I guess in a, in a, in a, in a fair uh, uh, share of the, of the world, right? Um, which is basically, I think, really in the end, uh, there's not, 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 it's difficult to put it in another way, but it's basically an increasing disregard for, for reality, right? The regard for reality, disregard, a very deep suspicion of any type of, uh, of scientific or technical knowledge, of previous accumulated knowledge, uh, and the way that this has been embraced, I think, by, by certain uh, actors in the political spectrum, not only in the right, right? I mean, I think it's more salient today both in the U.S. and, and uh, in Brazil, that it is just obviously the case to a, to a great extent in the right. But it's also true, I think, to a, in, a, in a large part of the left, and when we see the discussion about what's supposed to be a new monetary uh, theory in the U.S., it's not very far from that either, right? It's just a, a complete disregard for previous history or centuries of knowledge in the most, I mean, different areas that you that you might, might imagine, right? Um, in some sense, this is even more uh, uh, worrisome given that we live nowadays for various reasons, I think because of technology, access to data, uh, our capacity to process data, uh, the wide uh, amount of exchange of information that is available through NGOs, through the international organizations, be it to the World Bank, through the Inter-American Development Bank, through the World Health Organization. Uh, we live now, at, now in, I think, in a moment in time with, where never before we had accurate so much access to information, access to experiences in different countries, understanding of actually what seems to have worked or not in different countries. Of course, we, there's a, we don't know many things yet, and the research always keeps going. But if, if we think about several areas of, uh, of uh, very, several salient areas of public policy, more recently, I'd say conditional cash transfer programs, early childhood development, uh, teacher training, uh, subsidized health insurance schemes. So these are major areas of research in public health, in economics, in sociology. We now, now have actually an amount of information compiled about these different experiences, things that we, we are sure that they don't work, things that are pretty sure that they work, and things that we are not very much sure about. Uh, and we have an amount of information on that that I think really is completely unprecedented in, in, in the history of, of public policy. So it's something that I think we we're all, at least naively, I guess, a, a large part of the public policy and economic community would be expecting 15 years ago, let's say, would be that policy making in the future would become increasingly evidence-based. I'm not disregarding the limitations of evidence-based policy, the relevance of, a, of, a, of qualitative evidence as well, but the fact that the information is there is accessible and the idea that we would increasingly use this information to try to formulate boss, uh, policy in the best uh, possible way, right? For some reason that I think we're going to be discussing for centuries, I'm sure, and that we will could call for the historians and political scientists to try to understand, this, this has not been the case. I mean, the backlash in that direction over the last, most, most markedly, I would say, over the last five years has been absolutely tremendous, right? And this information has been increasingly disregarded in terms of policy making in, 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 in various different areas. Right? And the extent to which they have, they have been disregarded all obviously varies a little bit from country to country. In the US, even if you have a government that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't appreciate very much scientific evidence, there is some institutional knowledge and institutional develop, uh, development in certain areas that minimize a little bit, to some extent, the impact of, of those, right? In a country like Brazil, with less institutions, uh, less developed institutions, I think the threat of this, of permanent damage coming from this, is actually much, uh, much higher, right? So, just going back to my initial motivation for the, the pitch of this talk, I don't know if everybody followed, but what happened like 
three, four days ago, is that uh, the recently elected president in Brazil suggested that the, 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 the employment rate is calculated in the wrong way, like um, even saying something, I'm not quoting literally, but, but, the, but the contents is probably pretty close. Uh, I cannot imagine why the Census Bureau is doing this, probably it's just to fool the population, right? So this is the Census Bureau of your own country, and of course you're raising suspicions about like a basic statistic, that is the unemployment rate, the Brazilian Census Bureau is actually very, very good and very capable, Brazilian statistics are super high quality, the unemployment rate, as you may imagine in Brazil, is just the way it's calculated everywhere else in the world, because that's the way that the employment rate is defined, right? So to, to suggest that changing the employment rate, you might change the employment rate, it, it would just be something else, because that's exactly what the employment rate is. So it may seem, it may seem that this kind of a somewhat silly example, because in the short term, there are not gonna be major consequences for that, the Census Bureau is not gonna change the way it calculates the statistic. There was some embarrassment to the present, but that's nothing new. I guess that's, uh, that's become standard. Uh, more recently, but the problem is that I think this just this actually illustrates two dimensions that have become very recurrent in the current government, and uh, these specific episodes encapsulates, encapsulates these two dimensions in a in a very clear way, right? One is like a very light approach to public policy, right? I mean, almost casual approach to public policy, right? You, you're not sure exactly what the employment rate is, you don't like it, should it be, you think it should be lower, you say, well, this is wrong, I mean, they're doing something wrong, right? because you really don't know much about it, right? Uh, but this is true, not only in relation to this specific episode, this would be true to the way gun regulations have been approached, to the way uh, high, the supposedly high, highway speed meters are gonna be suspended because, I guess, uh, some people don't like them, uh, educational reforms are treated in a similarly light way. Uh, foreign policy, again, is treated in a similarly light way. And actually, we have a lot of evidence along several of these dimensions, right? We have a lot of evidence that the availability of guns does increase interpersonal violence. But there is an obvious evidence that uh, speed meters in, on, on the highways uh, reduce fatality traffic the traffic fatalities, but in some sense this just doesn't matter, right? If people have their superficial opinions and that's what's actually guiding public policy, right? And I think that's very scary, and it's very scary, uh, generally speaking, it would be very scary, and nowadays it's even more scary because we actually know a reasonably, reasonable uh, amount of things about several of these dimensions of policy and we're just throwing this away, right? Uh, another dimension that is like a more long-term institutional dimension that is threatened by this type of atti attitude is trust in the public sector itself, right? So uh, it goes without saying that when a president says that it seems that the Census Bureau is doing something just to fool the people, next time that there is some statistics, some important na national statistics that is released, part of the population that don't like that statistics are going to say, well, that's the Census Bureau, right? They know what the president has been saying, so obviously this cannot be right. right. In the case of Argentina under the Kirchners, where this happened for several years, eventually they inter intervened directly in the Census Bureau and manipulated national statistics, right? They manipulated inflation statistics. There's a gap in the, in the inflation statistics of Argentina that like for five, four or five years, nobody believed in the, in, the, in the statistics of Argentina because the government actually manipulated the statistics. It seems outrageous to think that this would happen in the President's Census Bureau today, but we've, we've had like three months of government, right? So you can only wonder what, what like three years would do, right? So, and this obvious, this, uh, I think, uh, compounding over time can really erode trust in government institutions, in this particular particular example, in a government institution that is actually extremely effective and very trustworthy and technically competent, right? Uh, com uh, com competent, right? So I think I mean there are other challenges. Uh, I think there is the, the, we are talking about social security reform a lot in Brazil right now. 
there is a fiscal challenge to social policy. Uh, it, it is actually true, and, and that part goes back to this issue of, uh, of disregard for facts. There is absolutely no debate if, that if uh, some form of social security reform is not in, uh, uh, approved in Brazil, that the scope for social policy is going to disappear in five, ten years. This is absolutely true as well. And the way that sometimes you see this being debated in the media uh, by the extreme left is also a disregard for reality as well. Uh, but I'm, I'm leaving the, the fiscal challenge, let's say, aside a little bit, because I think the immediate challenge that we have now is just to go back to, to evidence and go back to scientific knowledge in formulating, for, formulating uh, public policy, in particular uh, social policy, because I think it's, uh, we are really, it's difficult to imagine how we're going to end up in, in, in a couple of years if things, the direction and the way that poli the social policy is being formulated continues uh, the way we have seen in the last, uh, in the last uh, three months. Okay. So, yeah, so. Thank you. months, but uh, the signs so far are not, are not encouraging you. Good, good that you mentioned Social Security reform, which is being debated probably almost uh, by the right and the left without reference to data and evidence. But the gun safety that, uh, that Rodrigo mentions as well, uh, ignoring the data that we have. And education reform is perhaps the most glaring example where prejudices are determining major reforms uh, in Brazilian educational policy are not worth doing, uh, and that we ought to go back to the old ways and, and uh, the old curricula. So this can have, so it's not as though this rhetoric, Rodrigo, that you mentioned is harmless. It's creating, it, yes, eventually we get the facts right and, and improve the policies, but a lot of damage can be done and, and is being done. So although it's only three months, uh, that's it's a sign that trust in government is, is eroded in time, goes by, that's, that's not good. So thank you very much, Rodrigo. Thank you much, uh, Valerie, uh, Amy, and Absencia. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Amy. And now we'd like to turn to the second part. I think we're going to put uh, 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 Melina. I'm not going to do so long. I know, so I don't think I need them. But I would like to introduce to you a very honored guest, reintroduced, because I've already talked about her once. This is Melina Hamus, who is a, 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 a judge in the uh, federal uh, labor uh, courts system in Brazil. I'll let her explain to you the complicated structure of Brazilian courts, but there are courts that deal with labor issues, and they are the most um, uh, popular courts, the ones that deal with the greatest volume of issues, and those are the ones that are responsible for interpreting fairly the Brazil's very complex labor laws. Yunani uh, heads one of the most active such courts in the city of Sao Paulo, and uh, will bring with her perspective from the ground. She's just come from Sao Paulo to be with us today, so thank you very much, Yunani, that the floor is yours. Honor to be back here at Columbia. I, I really love this university and I love the Rose School. Uh, thanks, thanks, Thomas, for the invitation. Teresa, that is not here. Uh, Linda and all the Columbia Global Center the staff in Brazil that was uh, in Brazil and here that was uh, that were working hard to have these events. Well, um, as Thomas was explaining, my name is Marie Ramos. I am an LLM 97, 98 actually, from here, Columbia Law School, and then I uh, went out to Stanford. Um, and I really came from Brazil to, to be here because this is a very important subject matter. Um, and I'm glad to be here and be able to, um, to debate with you guys some ideas. Well, um, this is the topic that uh, was proposed to me, uh, inequality in Brazil, from a legal perspective. Uh, I've been working as a, a federal labor judge for the last 24 years. Before that, I was an assistant federal judge for four years, also in Sao Paulo. And um, 
um, for, from three years now in the Chief Administrative Justice of uh, the court, where I, I, the court, the court building where I, I've been working. It's the only uh, fully electronic uh, labor um, court building. They have 20 electronic, uh, uh, very busy uh, courtrooms. Um, but just uh, following a little bit of Professor Suarez was uh, saying, we are in a, in a time now that things have been changing a lot. Uh, our labor law just uh, uh, passed through a big, a complex reform that uh, basically uh, took away uh, many uh, labor rights that were uh, guaranteed for Brazilian workers since 1943. And now the new campaign of government also is to um, extinguish labor courts. So I don't know if uh, in one year from now we will have labor courts. Maybe I'll have to present myself next time as uh, something else. Well, this picture is not uh, is not uh, result of a photo show. It's a is a real picture. Uh, this is a, a neighborhood in São Paulo called Morumbi. Uh, how many of you guys here have, have been to Brazil? Oh, a lot of people. It's a it's a wonderful place to to visit. It's to live to. Uh, and this neighborhood in São Paulo, so many of some of you may know. Um, it's known not only because it has a big stage of the São Paulo uh, soccer, soccer club, but also because it's a, it's a very uh, controversial uh, neighborhood when you think about the conditions of people that live there. So here you have just a nice uh, penthouse with a private swimming pool, and here we have a favela uh, very near. Um, I lived in Moenby for a year and then I, I left because I really didn't like uh, to, to be in an environment where you could do basically nothing because there are like millions of people that live in the same neighborhood and that have nothing, basically. And how did you get to this situation? Um, I'm going to give you some um, uh, data that you guys may know. Uh, Brazilian population, we are over about 200, 207 million people. Uh, nowadays, 54% uh, of this population uh, are blacks, and 44% white, so we have a little uh, also um, population of Asians and uh, indigenous people. So we blacks are the majority, and we have only 131 years of freedom when you compare to whites that started their lives in Brazil around the 1500 already as um, free citizens. So they were around, running around free for more than 500 years, and we are just like 130 years out of these um, of these lockers. Um, the literacy rates, according to a 2016 survey, is um, on only 4.2 percent among white people and 9.9 .9 among blacks. Average average monthly income also uh, 700 for whites. 300, almost 400 for, for blacks. Unemployment, uh, 2017. Now we don't know, Professor Suarez, how this is going to be, but this was the well done uh, statistics that we had 90.5% uh, of whites unemployed um, at the end of 2017 against 14% of blacks. Uh, when you talk about children working um, and child labor, is a big, it's a big trouble in Brazil. In 2016, we had 35.8% of kids in between five and seven years old working. Those are white, but it was more than 63% for the black kids. Life expectancy is also uh, different depending on your race. 75 <coughs> years, a little bit more if you're white, and then six years less if you're black. Homicide rate, um, you have 16, uh, 16 white people in a group of 100,000 uh, victimized by one side. This was 2018, and this is more than double when it comes to blacks. So if you are black, you have much more of a possibility of being killed in Brazil. Um, this, uh, this fact show that uh, when you are black in Brazil, 
that determines where you're going to be born, how you're going to live, and how you're going to die. Um, this uh, inequality is even bigger, deeper, when you go to interse intersectional analysis. Because black women in Brazil, they receive, when compared to white women, even lower salaries, they have higher unemployment rates, they are more subject to violence, they are the majority of the heads uh, of households, and all the whole create a chain of inequality, not only for these women, but for the, the families that depend on them. And you may ask, well, but there are no rights in this country, there are no, no law that provide, prevents racism. And actually it does. Um, in our first law that uh, addressed the question of racism and prejudice was called Afonso Arenas Act. And uh, surprisingly, and it was edited, it was passed because of an incident with an American dancer in Sao Paulo in 1950. Catherine Grunham, she tried to uh, uh, check in a hotel and uh, she was prevented from, she uh, said she was going to to the government and the hotel and everybody, and then uh, this law was passed. Uh, even though uh, by probably 1990, almost the age of when Afonso Arinos died, uh, nobody had ever gone to jail in prison because of uh, practicing racism. Ah, but now we have hope. We have, we have a new constitution since 1988. This was a very modern, um, a mo modern uh, statute. Uh, it's also, uh, it's, it's off here. Can you just help? It's just off. Oh, well, we can't see it there. <laughs> Thank you. There it is. <laughs> okay, yeah, here I cannot see it. So, um, in 1988, ooh, Congress passed a new constitution, it was very modern, and had um, many, uh, many, uh, let's say, uh, articles talking about racism and racial discrimination. Uh, one of the interesting uh, provisions is that uh, one of the principles that governs Brazil when it's related to other countries is the repudiation of racism and terrorism. Uh, this constitution says that everyone is equal uh, in, in despite of color, gender, or any other factor. Uh, the, they say also this constitution that the objectives, goals of this country, Brazil, is to promote the well-being without prejudice. Um, racism also was uh, 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 classified as a non-bearable crime and is not subject to the statute of limitation. So it doesn't matter when this uh, crime was committed, the, the, the perpetrator, perpetrator could be still um, punished by the law. This constitution had to be uh, regulated by some other federal uh, provisions, other federal statutes. So in 1989, we had this uh, new statute called, at the time, Lei Kaoa because of his, uh, the congressman that, that uh, proposed it. And uh, so it, it regulated the constitution, it defined crimes based on race, color, religion, national origin, and also introduced um, um, later in 1997, it was introduced a uh, new article in, in our penal code, that is article 140, uh, which uh, defines as a crime uh, any sort of defamation based on race. And this type of crime is aggravated if it is used, uh, committed with social media. We have more, we have a lot of laws. Uh, this law, uh, 1929, 19, <laughs> oh, it's a screen, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, this law passed in 1995 was uh, very interesting because it uh, aimed to prevent and punish uh, employment discrimination, uh, which is a big trouble in Brazil. 
penalties one or two years of that ransom. So now it's a question, how with so many laws, with so many black people in the population, we have so much racism and inequality, how, how could it be? Does anyone has an answer? <laughs> You do? What is? Maybe because the country is a racist country. It's a racist country, yes, it is. A very, very big racist country. Well, the, the answer is the underrepresentation of blacks in lawmaking, in decision making, in policy making positions. This is the answer. You have a lot of laws, but they are not enforced. It. So they are just in the paper. Since 1889, when Brazil started to be a republic, when we had our first president, so far we had 39 presidents. These 39 presidents, only one was black. It was in 1989, uh, because of some like confusion at the time, he was not even elected. Um, and also we had, among these 39, only one pre woman president, and that was victimized by an impeachment. Mayors, 2016, we had our uh, last election for, for mayor, for city halls. Uh, there are 71% in the whole country of the mayors that were elected are white, and only 29% are blacks. Judges, in the judiciary, I can tell you uh, very well. Uh, we had our last uh, um, survey last year, 17% of black judges and only 80, and against 83% of all the judges in the country, they are white. Senate, House of Representatives, uh, with last election last year, only 4% of black people were, were elected. Um, public attorney's office, 2016, the last survey, only 2% of public attorneys uh, in Brazil were blacks, 98% whites. And this is not a problem only in Brazil. We know uh, that we had similar problems here. This is, uh, I, love, I love this picture. This is a 2012 uh, alumni photo for, for the Winter Luncheon, the Law School alumni. And uh, here we have 24 judges. And from these 24 judges, only six were black. And uh, I'd like to honor my great friend, the late uh, Sheila Abdusalam, that was sit, sit by me, and uh, she was the first woman, ju black woman, to sit as a judge in the New York. Uh, that's Judge Greenway at the very top, is Valerie's husband. Oh no! <laughs> this I is so nice! I just texted him. I told him to come today. <laughs> oh, wow. You should be here. You should be here. We you know meet again. <laughs> this is nice. Yes. Uh, so we know that uh, this uh, inequality in uh, blacks uh, in positions of leadership, in, in positions of power, is also a problem here. Um, in Brazil, um, as another example in terms of a, a judiciary, this is um, my, let's say, boss. Dr. Lavio Mementerio, she's the one that authorized me to be here today. And uh, she's the chief judge of the court of the Sao Paulo uh, Federal Court of, the, of Appeals. And we had 90, 90 uh, judges there. She's the only woman and she's the only, she's the only black woman. There are other women, but she's the only uh, black. And last year she was elected to be the chief judge. It's, it's the first time that she's court as a, a, a woman and a black, a black woman as a chief justice. So it's an inequality that we see here, we see there, and there are um, uh, very uh, serious, um, there are very serious uh, results from this inequality. Uh, in a country like Brazil, when 54% of people are not represented or they are misrepresented, uh, this is a very, very serious problem. This is a threat for democracy, since democracy, as you in law school know, is, a, is the government, is the gov government made by the power, made by, made, made by the people. 
So, uh, in this regard, we can say that we don't have a democracy in Brazil, since 54% of people cannot be in the power. When you uh, think also uh, on these numbers, on how uh, this inequality is affecting Brazil, uh, we, can, we may say that this affects not only blacks, but affects white people too. I always say this, it's very important to think how, uh, uh, because of racism and because of discrimination, so much loss uh, for people, so you have personal loss, you, you, have, you have social loss, you have economic losses. Because all these people that have all these uh, uh, very uh, unfair salaries, these unfair income, and these women that cannot really support their families, they are not buying, they are not consumers, they don't have access to education, they are not going to contribute as they could to the country. And they are not going to, the, the companies are not going to sell, government is not going to collect taxes. So it's a, it's a circle that everybody is losing. So it's a lose-lose a a lose game that we need to change. Um, I will not uh, talk about, I could list here a list of solutions. But uh, I left this for Anderson, Professor Soares that work with public policies or for, uh, and uh, social uh, movements. Uh, and I do too, but I do it on, on the ground. Um, but to me, the only solution to change the situation is really to put black people in power. You, you cannot make change when uh, people that are in power, they don't, they, they don't know what's happening to you, they don't know what's happening to the people that are going to be affected by these policies, by these decisions. This is Carolina Maria de Jesus. I was just looking here at Amazon, and they do sell their books here in English. Um, she was one of the greatest Brazilian uh, writers of uh, the last century. Uh, she was a woman uh, living in a favela, and here you can see her uh, at work. She was uh, collecting trash, like recyclable trash, to support her three, four kids. She was a single mother, and she spent most of her life um, writing poems and books and papers that she could collect on the street, taken from the trash. And this is one of the poems that she has that I like the most, that talks about inequality in Brazil. Don't say that I was a trash, that I live on the margin of life. Say that I was looking for work, but I was always slighted. Tell the Brazilian people that my dream was to be a writer, but I did not have the money to pay for a publisher. It is always time to, co to correct things, correct policies, you know, to, to have a better society. And I'm a big fan, of course, of Martin Luther King, and I love this sentence that, she, that he uh, summarizes so much. The time is always right to do what is right, so we can uh, try to change things, even in a time so uh, difficult as we have in Brazil, and that you guys also have here when you talk about social policies. Thank you very much. and hopefully there will be some additional discussion that's very inspiring and, uh, uh, and, and truth. So we want to think about this a little less for the and, and others to come up with some of the solutions uh, here uh, in a little bit. But I'd like another turn to other uh, honored guests, and I think it may, that is very uh, bad in, uh, in the translation. Anderson, uh, I've already introduced him once, but just briefly again, he's an a, a, so you could describe me, and I think it's true, as an educator and a social activist uh, and a, a politician and someone who has lived his life not on the left, not on the right, not even on the center. He's lived it on the periphery uh, of uh, the lar large cities of Brazil, in, in particular his native city of Rio de Janeiro, his Universidade da Correria, that I referred to a little earlier, to 
give entrepreneurial skills to the poorest of the poor in the peripheral areas of, uh, of Rio, Espedna, Sao Paulo, other cities in Brazil, and even, as I understood it, talking to Anderson a little earlier today, to even to Europe. So we'd like uh, to welcome, ask you to welcome, help, help me welcome Anderson Branza. Você vai tentar em inglês ou quer que a gente ajude você? A Daniela, I'd like to introduce, it's not just a random person who's appeared here, this is a Daniela Denise, our uh, uh, senior program manager up until last year at the Rio Global Center. So thank you, Daniela, for being here and for your help in uh, translating Anderson's remark. If you should need the help. Okay. Uh, you want me to set that microphone? And I, I don't know um, maybe for the video we need Use the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Use the handheld. You need a handheld. Which one he prefers? I will use the other one. You can use yeah. Oh, one. thank you. Ah. Yeah, I, yeah, it's too formal. Oh, okay. Ah. I want to apologize because I wrote my speak in English, but I have to speak in Portuguese. My English version in English is this guy. I have a tendency inside of me. My voice scared me. <laughs> you know, like Brad Pitt in Glorious Bastard, found I, 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 I have my accent. So, so this voice is crazy. I, I don't talk. I, I know this is not my voice. God, please let me be free from Tennessee inside me. Okay, Danny, você vai me ajudar. Okay. Okay. Eu vou resumir o que eu vou dizer. É muito simples. Eu fiz umas coisas com umas figuras bem bonitas. Olha só, você vai falar devagar okay. e você vai falando em determinados momentos para eu poder traduzir. Ok. Senão vai ficar em cima um do outro. Ah, ok. Tudo bem. É, eu fiz um resumo e tem umas imagens bem bonitas, mas é só para vocês é, ficarem iludidos. He did a summary uh, of the presentation with some pretty pictures. But it's just to uh, sort of misguide you in this process. O resumo, eu odeio PowerPoint. He hates PowerPoint. <laughs> o resumo do que eu vou dizer é, nós criamos uma escola. Uh, the summary of what he wants to say, what he has to say is that he created a school. Para criar uma nova classe média negra no Brasil. To empower and to create a new middle class, a new black middle class in Brazil. Acabou, é isso que eu disse. That's all we had to say. <laughs> <laughs> we had in Brazil 388 years of slavery. Eu não sei como são as famílias nos Estados Unidos. I don't know how our families in the United States. Mas no Brasil, as pessoas pobres têm muitos casamentos interraciais. But in Brazil, the poor families have a lot of interracial marriages. So, minhas irmãs são negras, meu pai é negro. My sisters are black, my father is black. Minha avó é negra. My grandmother is black. Eu não vi negro, negro, negro. I, I was not born black, as yeah. in my color, my skin, properly. E nós, na nossa família, nós somos educados a sermos racistas também. And we were born, and we are taught to be racist when we are born. Porque o racismo destrói a, a mente da pessoa. Racism destroys the mind of a person. As minhas irmãs, quando elas conseguem alguma coisa na vida, elas não acreditam que vão conseguir. My sisters, when they achieve something, uh, they don't believe that they were capable of doing that. Porque o racismo destrói a mente da pessoa negra, porque ela sofre com isso e ela reproduz dentro dela. Because the mind of a black person suffers racism since the beginning, so that they don't believe that they are capable of doing things, and it affects their confidence. Minhas irmãs dizem para mim que eu tive sorte porque eu não nasci como elas. My sisters tell me that I was lucky that I was not born like them. E elas são minhas irmãs. And they are my sisters. Elas me criaram porque meu pai não ficou em casa, ele me abandonou. My sisters actually raised me because my father actually, uh, left when I was very young. No Brasil não houve políticas de reparação para as pessoas que foram escravizadas. In Brazil there were not uh, properly reparation politics to um, for the African Brazilian communities. Eu não sei como é nos Estados Unidos, mas já existe uma classe média nos Estados Unidos, talvez desde o século XIX. I don't know how it is in the United States, but I was told that there is, in fact, a middle class 
since the 19th century. As pessoas brancas no Brasil, de esquerda, criticam quando eu digo que pessoas negras precisam ter poder econômico. Some white people in Brazil criticize me when I say that black people need to have economic power. Ok, pessoas brancas decidiram que nós temos que ser socialistas. So white people <laughs> actually tell us that we need to be socialists. Mas essas pessoas brancas já têm um emprego, um diploma. But those people, those white people, they have a job, they have a diploma, they have a degree. Não moram numa favela. They don't live in the slums. Elas entram numa loja, nenhum segurança vai atrás delas. No security guard prevents them from entering in a store. Ok, vamos ser socialistas. Mas quando todo mundo tiver na mesma linha, nós seremos socialistas. Ok, let's be socialists. But after everyone is on the same level, we can then become socialists. Agora não dá. Now, no, we cannot do that now. Eu fundei uma escola chamada Universidade da Correria. I founded a, a university of running after. Running after. <laughs> que em inglês se chama Universidade da Resistência. Which in English means University of Resistance. Yeah, as pessoas vão entender melhor. And people will understand better as I talk about it. O objetivo da Universidade da Correria. The goal of the University of Resistance. É ser uma instituição de educação que resolve, que soluciona o gap histórico brasileiro. The goal of the University of Resistance is to solve a problem of uh, is an institution, an education institution that helps solve a problem of educational gap in Brazil. O capitalismo começou na Inglaterra e se espalhou pelo mundo, promovendo genocídio, escravidão e morte. Ok? Capitalism starts started in England uh, and promoted death and murder and genocide all over the world. O racismo não é um problema de pessoas negras. O racismo é um problema do Ocidente. Racism is not a problem only that affects only black people. It affects the whole Western world. Qualquer problem. instituição de educação deveria considerar isso. Any educational institution should consider that. Nós criamos uma escola que então considera isso. We then created a school, an institution that considers that. Nós não recebemos dinheiro de governo. We don't receive any money from any government. Nós criamos crowdfunding. We have our own crowdfunding. Uh, pedimos doações. Donations. Ou fazemos parcerias com fundações ou empresas. Or partnerships with foundations and companies and private companies. Todo o dinheiro que nós conseguimos, nós colocamos mulheres negras na turma como bolsistas, de graça. All the money that we are able to raise goes to white, uh, to black women to go and sit and study and at school. Porque o gap histórico brasileiro se relaciona com as mulheres negras. Because the educational gap in Brazil is related to black women. E eu acho que eu sei como é que funciona nos Estados Unidos também é assim. And I think that I know how it works here as well. Então a Universidade da Correria chama mulheres negras de periferia de favela. The, the university, uh, this, uh, the University of Resistance invites women, black women from the slums, from the poor communities. E tenta criar novos negócios com essas mulheres, que elas se tornem empreendedoras. And try to teach entrepreneurship to them so that they can have their own business. Essa bobagem que eu vou mostrar para vocês. This is the silliness that I'm showing you now. É como nós na periferia sentimos o que aconteceu com a história do Brasil nos últimos. How, how do we feel in the past 15 years what has happened in Brazilian politics? Isso não é um estudo acadêmico. This is not an academic study or, or isso, research. Isso é fruto de muitas conversas. It's, it's the result of a lot of conversations. Nas escolas, nas igrejas, nas in schools, in, in churches, in families. No governo Lula nós tivemos um momento importante para os trabalhadores. In the previous government, in Lula's government, we have a very important moment okay. um, for the workers. Crescimento da economia, defesa Economic de growth, humanos. Human rights. E principalmente a criação de uma nova classe média. And the creation of a new middle class. É aí que mora o nosso estudante. There is where our student is. Essa pessoa que estuda na nossa escola, ela surgiu na história no governo Lula. This person emerged from history during this government. No governo Lula, muitas mulheres negras e muitas pessoas negras entraram para a universidade. During that government, a lot of um, African American or Brazilian uh, black um, students got into the universities. E essas pessoas precisam trabalhar e estudar. And these people need to study and to work, to afford living. 
No governo Dilma nós tivemos um corte desse processo, um impeachment. During the Dilma government, uh, there was an interruption in this process. No governo Temer nós ouvimos falar de um estado judicial. During Temer's government, after Dilma, there was a judicial state, so to speak, in where there was an interruption in this process. Yeah, e no governo Bolsonaro nós ouvimos falar de golden shower. <laughs> and during this government, we are now talking about what is a golden shower. I'm very embarrassed at this time. We are you have Trump, so we are all together in this. Uh, David, David Duke disse, disse isso sobre Bolsonaro. Ele parece conosco. David, David Duke said that he sounds like us. Okay. Uh, essa instituição disse que nós somos hoje uma autocracia. Human, Human Rights Watch said that now Brazil is an autocracy. Uh, entre 2009 e 2013 nós tivemos um fenômeno na juventude brasileira. Elas entraram no Twitter, no Facebook e no WhatsApp. Between 2009 e 2013, uh, we, can, we can see a, a, a growth of a participation of the population in social media. Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp. E é lá que nós criamos um ecossistema. And there is where our ecosystem is. Pela primeira vez, as pessoas de favela estavam se comunicando diretamente. For the first time, people from the poor communities, from the favelas, are communicating with each other. Sem uma ONG no meio. Without an intermediary or an own NGO. E foi exatamente nessa época, em 2013 a 2016, que começou a onda de fake news no Brasil. And exactly between 2013 and 2017 that the whole wave of fake news has started. Okay, nós estamos perdidos hoje, sim. Are we lost now? Yes. Acho que o Brasil nasceu perdido. Brazil was born lost. Quando nós falamos da Universidade da Correria, nós precisamos falar dos períodos compreendidos entre 2009 e 2016. When we talk about the University of Resistance, we have to talk about the periods between 2009 and 2013 because they were important for the porque eu pertenço à primeira geração de ativistas digitais do Rio de Janeiro. Because I belong to the first generation of digital activists in Brazil. E o que vocês estão vendo em azul são os principais as temas dessa década. And those are the main themes of that decade for Brazil in general. A evolução do crime organizado. The evolution of um, organized crime. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> e por fim, lá no final, nós falamos de outros países digitais. <coughs> Paramilitary groups are also something that is also something that should be taken into consideration. Esse é o maior problema hoje do Rio de Janeiro. This is the biggest challenge and the biggest problem in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro today. E é curioso porque o Rio voltou ao poder. And it's curious because Rio now uh, is back in the power. O presidente do Rio. The president of Brazil is from Rio de Janeiro. E as práticas políticas do Rio de Janeiro estão em Brasília de novo. And the, and the political practices of Rio, uh, the damaging pra political practices of Rio, are now in Brasilia, the capital. Por que Marielle é importante para a escola e importante para o futuro? Why is Marielle so important for the school, for our school, and for the future? Marielle foi um recado de pessoas brancas. Uh, Marielle's death uh, was actually a, um, a message, a message from white people. Foi um recado do racismo estrutural. Yes, it was a message from a stru structural racism in Brazil. Para minha geração. To my generation. Eu conheci Marielle quando ela, ela ainda era estudante. I met Marielle when she was still a student. Ela deu aula na escola que eu frequentei. She taught in the school that I was in, that I took classes in. Quando a nossa geração se torna liderança no Brasil, eles matam Marielle. When she becomes a leadership in the country, then they kill her. Nós precisamos então falar de movimentos identitários. We need to talk about identity. E descobrir uma economia que leve em consideração a diversidade. And find uh, what, in what ways uh, the economy can include uh, a, a diverse population. Nós não estamos falando de criar novos milionários. We're not talking about creating new millionaires. Você sabe, essas pessoas que se reúnem em uma startup e ficam falando um monte de bobagem porque os Those people jogos... who go to a startup and start like um, talking a bunch of nonsense between each other, among each other. Steve Jobs não é uma referência para nós. Mad Walker era uma referência para nós. Mad Walker is a reference. Foi a primeira mulher presidente de um banco nos Estados Unidos. The first woman to be the president e of a bank in the United States. 
And she's a black woman. Nós precisamos falar de economia dentro de uma visão afrocentrada. We need to talk about Pode Precisamos falar de economia dentro de uma visão afrocentrada. Afro We need to have an afrocentric view of economics. Quando uma pessoa vence, todas e as outras pessoas vencem também. When one person of color wins, all the others can win as well. O capitalismo ele não prevê a abundância. Capitalism does not entice foresee abundance. E o capitalismo, a raiz do capitalismo é racista. And the roots of capitalism is racist. Não haveria... What? Eu estou pegando isso aqui porque isso aqui eu não uso essa moeda, I'm mas grabbing, eu preciso mostrar isso para você. I'm grabbing this. I don't use this currency, but I need to show you. Who is this guy? Who is this? Preto. Negro. He's all like that. Quem é o dono desse dinheiro? Who owns this money? Quem é o dono dessa instituição? Who owns this Quem é o dono desse sistema? Who owns this system? Eu falei em Oxford. I spoke at Oxford. Cambridge. Cambridge. E agora aqui. And now Columbia. O sistema pertence a homens brancos. The system belongs to white men. A Universidade da Correria é profundamente incomodada com isso. The University of Resistance gets Extremely bothered by that. Eu vou terminar minha fala porque eu já falei muito. Todo I mundo. will end my, my speech now because I spoke too much. Uh, oh, talk about money is very important to create a new black middle class in Brazil. Oh, let me see. Okay. Uh, is there in Brazil? Seven million people are in. No, 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 no. Yeah, he made a mistake. It's actually 388. Okay. Mas não teve nenhuma assim. Isso é importante. A Alemanha paga indenização pelos quatro anos ou cinco anos de opressão que ela promoveu ao povo judeu. Eu vou falar, não foram só quatro anos, mas vamos lá. Alemanha, na verdade, paga reparação aos povos judeus por os anos em que eles opressam essa comunidade. Imagina três, quase quatro séculos e nenhuma indenização às pessoas que fundaram o Estado brasileiro. Imagine now four centuries and no reparation to the people who actually founded or built the foundations of that country. Eu peço desculpas a você, mas eu tenho muita raiva. I apologize in advance, but I actually feel a lot of anger. Esse é o plano da Universidade do Rio. Falar de futuro, diversidade, economia coletiva e uma nova economia. This is the plan. Uh, this is the plan for the University of Resistance. Um, we talk about future, diversity, uh, collective efforts, and new economy. Não apenas dinheiro, mas vida comunitária. Not only money, but community life. Na Alemanha me chamaram para fazer um workshop na Universidade da Correia. In Germany, they called me to do a workshop with the university. E eu cheguei na Alemanha, só tinha alemão. And I got there, and there were only German people there. Os alemães têm recursos, são classe média. They have resources. They are a middle-class country. Mas são pessoas solitárias. But they are very lonely. A favela obriga a ter relações com as pessoas. The the impoverishment in which the communities in Brazil, specifically the favelas, um, require that you create a community life. E a África e as culturas africanas nos ensinam a viver em coletivo. And the African culture and the history that we inherited. Um, impel us and, and uh, make us live in a collective way. Nós acreditamos que uma nova economia é um momento em que todos ficam ricos, não uma só pessoa. We believe that a new economy is a moment where everyone can uh, in red, can become uh, richer and more uh, connected with each other. Okay. Para finalizar, o que nós fazemos? Nós ensinamos, inspiramos, preparamos e apresentamos. This is what we do. We learn, we get inspired, get it done, and we show. Uh, temos uma turma, depois nós fazemos uma banca, isso é um exemplo de banca final, e depois criamos uma mentoria. We create a cohort. Uh, this is an, actually a picture of a cohort presenting and pitching their idea. Isso. E, bom, esses são os nossos números. And those are our numbers in terms of demographics. Uh, nós temos um exemplo de, dessas duas alunas. Chama Luana e Michelle. We have the example of these two um, 
alums or students who graduated at the uh, University of Resistance. Elas são empreendedores trabalham com assessores de moda. They are two entrepreneurs and they work with um, jewelry and accessories. Um okay. Fashion. And they make money. E isso é uma, é uma parte do trabalho que elas desenvolvem na escola. This is part of the, uh, the work that they do. Ou seja, nós temos algo a dizer. We have something to say. Mercado é o lugar onde todos se encontram. Market is the place where everyone meets. E nós criamos negócios e novas comunidades conectadas pela educação. And we create new business connected by the, this new kind of education. Para terminar minha fala, eu espero que vocês estejam vendo essa foto. Há uma mulher nessa foto. Uh, to finish my uh, speech, I hope that you can look at this picture and the woman in this picture. Essa mulher visitou a Universidade da Correria ano passado. This woman, Marina Silva, was a candidate for the presidency uh, in 2018, and she visited the University of Resistance. Nós decidimos apoiar uma mulher negra para a presidência. We decided to support this woman because she's a, a black woman running for presidency. Eu fui com Marina Silva em quase todas as periferias do Rio e São Paulo. I went with Marina to basically all the uh, peripheries and the uh, um, slums in Brazil. Bom, e é por causa dela que nós continuamos o nosso trabalho. And that's and because of her that we continue our work. É isso, meu tempo acabou. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Thank you. Daniela, thank you very much. Take a little break there. Uh, uh, now, if, if we can stay just a little bit, it's so already past the time. I wanted to start the discussion, but I would like our guest, Linda, will orchestrate this. Uh, and we'd like uh, to ask our uh, four, uh, four panelists and, uh, to join us uh, in these chairs here. Can you just bring them up? And I'll do the same on this side. I wonder if I can get some help over here. Um, and we'd like to ask you to sit, if you could, so we can open up, thank you very much, you know, I'm bringing those over. Uh, sit so that we can then open up the discussion to the... Milene, Val, Valerie, Rodrigo, Anderson. We'll do it here. So that was a, quite an array of presentations and issues. I want to sincerely thank them uh, for being with us late on a Friday afternoon and after long weeks, no doubt, a research study and, and, and uh, other work. Thanks especially to those who have been in the, and Anderson come so far to, to join us. Um, I, I maybe, I'm going to open it up, so please get your questions ready and there'll be main perguntas, as they say in Brazil, main objetivas, right to the point, and in, in indicate the faculty member or uh, other uh, guys, guests you'd like to direct your question to. Let's, Let's open it up then. Who would like to be first? Ivy, thank you very much. We'll pass, and we'll pass the mic to you too. Thank you so much for putting together this very rich panel. We learn a lot from the Brazilian perspective. I've been to Brazil uh, many times, and I have a special experience there, but I want to ask quickly my question related to the case of Valongo and Pretos Novos issue in Rio de Janeiro. And now we have some judicial uh, decision there. And today it was about creating a museo de escravidão e libertad, but they canceled it and said they're going to create a new museo nacional de la cultura e historia afro-brasileira. So what do you think about this concept and what this should be? Thank you. Can you explain that, uh, what, what the, the background is, the Kaisi by Longor, where the slaves arrived yeah. at the slave market in Rio? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, the Kaisi by Longor is a historical site now in Brazil, in Rio, in downtown Rio. Uh, that's the place where slaves were um, were um, getting to Brazil by small boats, from the big boats they were taking to small boats to Kaiso Valongo. And I was there at, the, at that event during Museo da Manhã, the Colombia uh, Leadership, Colombia Valongo Center Rio event. I, I didn't have lunch and I ran to visit Kaiso Valongo 
uh, because they have their museum. And this is the saddest uh, uh, story about this kind of Alongo. Many of these thousands of slaves that arrived there, uh, they were already sick, so they would not be taken to be sold to this place where they were selling slaves, to slave markets. But um, they were um, actually, uh, they stayed by the cars in a house to die, and then they were buried very, very near in a place that they would call Cemitério dos Pretos Novos, uh, New Black Cemetery. Uh, it was like just uh, not uh, a decent, of course, uh, burial. And uh, there is now a museum near Caso Valongo because many houses were, were built over the cemetery after so many years. So it, the disrespect to human life is, was like uh, incredible. And uh, they, uh, I guess it was uh, by the, became a national, international history uh, site. Yes, national. Yeah, yes, so it's protected yes, now heritage, right? in, in the national heritage. And uh, so that's why there is this movement to, to build this now a now museum around. Uh, one. Oh, uh, I'm actually saying that uh, all the pictures that you guys saw, it's in the Kaiser Valongo because this is where his headquarters is. Have you visited? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. It was a big, a big, uh, big uh, building. See the hands and see who would like to ask questions as we land the time. Uh, I see Janice just the second and over here. I just would say quickly that uh, Milani said she went from one locale to visit Kaiser by Longo. That locale was the Museum of the Future. Yeah. And this is the most spectacular building in Rio. And, and the Museum of the Past, which they should have, is, doesn't exist yet. Yeah, but it should. Uh, Janice, please. Oh, um, let's see. Uh, my first question was about Valerie. Um, I was just wondering if um, you found the same experience in Harlem between um, the horrible sensation of not being a full person, a father de Sejanchi, and the necessity to acquire status, status symbols or do things to make yourself feel better, which has a certain overconsumption, and on the other hand, to not like to interact with um, any official institutions, including banks or any place that you have to do anything, uh, and much prefer to be around people who won't tell you to go to the back of the line or look down on you like dirt. And so I can really well understand from my uh, 50 years of experience in Brazil how they would rather pay more and be less humiliated. But is that true um, in uh, the US cities? And yeah. So um, we have done a few uh, experiments in Harlem, again, uh, but what I will say is, is a couple things. One is what people think of as Harlem and what Harlem has become has radically changed in the past five years. So the, the studies that we actually ran were right outside Whole Foods. And Harlem today, I believe, is over 50% white. Right. So that, that tells you something already. So, so, so that's that's one. And what because of the dramatic gentrification um, in Harlem, this one group that's just being pushed out, but the group that's there, one of the things that we're thinking about is the difference between a store being physically there versus being psychologically available. So the banks, the stores, Whole Foods, they might be there, but what, what we're trying to look at there is whether they're, just because you can physically walk to them, it doesn't mean that you have psychological access to them. So, so in many respects, the, my, my point of what we're trying to show is that these processes are similar, but that they stand in contrast. A lot of people describe what we're talking about as conspicuous consumption, overconsumption. But what we're trying to argue is that it's a logical response to when you have to repeatedly contend, contend with discrimination, that the natural response is to pay a little bit more for the identity safety. Oh yeah, no, I, um, yeah. I, the poor always pay more. 
Yes. I mean, that's the name of the very famous yeah. book. I mean, yeah. and then when he wants to buy something on separate payments over a long time, pays seven or eight times the, the and cost. And we're, of we're hoping object. to expand to um, look at a few different cities in South Africa as well. So we're trying to sort of expand this uh, argument uh, as well as look more specifically at black women. Yeah. Well, I think that's absolutely fantastic. I have a very other question. Um, I wanted to ask. Um, Rodrigo Suarez, um, this whole idea of the, um, that you were talking about the <laughs> evidence-based policies going out of favor. It, I see such a parallel with Trump and fake news. And um, do you think that this, this whole reversion, this whole erosion of the gains that we've made in the last many decades, I mean, certainly in Brazil since the end of the dictadura and in the U.S. since the New Deal, that are being eroded now. Uh, do you see this as um, being inspired by each other or coming out from a, a global moment that seems to be generating this turn away from inclusion and to um, identity politics and excluding others? Well, I think it's a tough question right there. <laughs> I think it's definitely it's something broader, right? I mean, there's no way to get around it, right? If you from from Russia to Hungary to England with the Brexit to Turkey to the U.S. to Brazil, I mean, there's something. I mean, I honestly I don't understand it. I wish I did, but it, I, for me, it really now we 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 try to rationalize with the middle class maybe losing ground, and there are different stories. But I mean, if we we all, we all went back five years ago when we described the world today for ourselves. I mean, I wouldn't believe that it would be possible, right? I would probably have that all of my... my so it's, uh, I think we're going to take many years trying to understand that, but I do think uh, it, it is a, it's a generalized backlash. I, I, I have a hard, hard time understanding it to what extent some generational wish and memory that fades of past similar experiences. But I think it's difficult without trying to uh, uh, over uh, exaggerate. I think it's difficult not to see parallels with, with political movements in, in, in Western Europe and, and uh, late 20s and early 30s. I think there's something underlying that, that is coming. And uh, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's not clear to me where it's coming from, but uh, we've certainly screwed up uh, as policy makers in yeah. several dimensions. Well, right? Anderson, for say, uh, eu acho que você, o movimento dos jovens, o movimento da resistência e o novo educação é um caminho de enfrentar esse negócio que se você acompanhou, você está, você está criando essa universidade virtualmente o in, in Pessoa, it's French. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, Janice uh, is asking, maybe Janice, I'll hold on there. I'll promise to okay. translate it and okay. we'll come I'll back to that. Uh, I appreciate it. Let's get another question here and then and I'll okay. translate that. I, I can say it very quickly. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yes, go ahead. I, I asked whether he thinks that this movement of young people, which I also noticed very strongly in favelas and peripheries of Rio, um, these movements of resistance, cultural and educational, do you think that's the way out of this dilemma of, um, of oppression that's returning? And, do you, and is your school virtual or in person? I mean, is it, do, do people come to see each other or are they just connected digitally? Okay. The school is a, a real school. We have a place in Valor. <coughs> in Valor. Yeah. We began in the complex of the Maré. Favela da Maré. In Rio. It is found in Rio. E agora nós estamos partindo para o online. Now we're starting online. Mas começamos isso. A segunda coisa é, eu não gostaria de colocar, eu não gostaria de responsabilizar a juventude negra para resolver o problema da democracia brasileira. <laughs> Esse problema foi criado pelas pessoas brancas que estão em casa. As pessoas negras já morrem. E elas não têm que responder por isso. Mas eu entendo que é necessário criar uma resistência. Já tem. Está no ar. 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 
Do, do I need my hand? It's for the. It's for the oh, okay. Last year. Right. Uh, well, thank you for the for the presentation. And I got here right, so I couldn't see that. But uh, uh, I'll try to formulate it in English, and then I'll because the question is mainly for uh, Anderson. So um, the first one, I have two questions. One is a simple one: Why exile? Why are you exiled in in Portugal? And what, what, why is that self-identification of what, what's going on? Por que o exílio? Por que vocês okay. considerem exilados? Quando você está aqui, eu vou dar uma chance para a segunda pergunta. Você está pensando nisso? Oh, sure. Get more dynamic. Uh, a pessoa, quando se torna exilada, não é um governo que reconhece. Quando a pessoa, quando a pessoa, a pessoa que se torna exilada, não é um governo que reconhece isso. Eu me tornei exilado porque eu fui ameaçado durante três anos. Became an exile myself because I was threatened during for three years. Ameaças vindas de pessoas da extrema direita brasileira. People coming from the threats coming from the extreme right of the Brazilian in Brazil. Ameaças públicas ofereceram dinheiro pela minha morte. Public threats they offered money publicly to kill me. Num dos maiores eventos de literatura do Brasil. In one of the biggest literature events in Brazil. Algo como 20 mil dólares para matar no evento. Something like twenty thousand dollars to kill me at that event. O chefe desse grupo está preso. The chief of the group that made that threat is now in prison. Mas eles ameaçaram um deputado chamado Jean Willis. They did threaten another deputy federal deputy by the name of Jean Willis. E outras pessoas. And other people. Eu e Jean Willis saímos do Brasil em dezembro. Jean Willis and I left Brazil together in December. E eu fui para Portugal que é uma nação amiga. I went to Portugal because it's a friendly nation. A Europa não vai me dar asilo político. Europe will not give me political exile. A polícia reconhece que a minha vida no Rio de Janeiro ela corre risco. And the police don't know that in Rio know that my life is under threat in Brazil. Eu não acho, eu não acho nenhum status, eu não acho nem nem um pouco interessante ser estar vivendo o que eu estou vivendo. I don't think it's any status or what I want to live the way I'm living today. Eu não tenho mais família. Eu moro num país que não me respeita politicamente. Eu não tenho mais chão. Casa. E outras pessoas vão sair. Ah, Marina Silva foi ela que me ajudou a sair do Brasil. Marina Silva, whose picture you saw, former president of Canada, helped him to leave. A pior coisa sobre isso tudo que eu estou falando para vocês é que nós estamos voltando para uma ditadura. The worst thing about everything I've just told you is that we're coming back toward a dictatorship. E as pessoas negras de periferia vão morrer primeiro porque sempre morrem. Black people on the periphery are the first ones to die. Vou lhe dar a chance de eu acho que é a segunda questão. Vou lhe dar. Obrigado. Obrigado. Eu acho que era uma, um esclarecimento importante para todo mundo que está aqui também, não só para mim. Thank you. It was a good clarification. The second one I think has to do with, with that, and maybe it makes more sense in Portuguese because it's about the term correria, universidade da correria. I'll ask in English first and then I'll. Because okay. correria, um, you translate it as resistance, but I think the way one, one way I would translate it, I'm from Sao Paulo, and maybe it means different things in the, in the two cities. But it's the hustle and the, the hassle, and it's very much associated with the idea hustling, hustling yeah. of the of you know um, not a legal but informal economy of the the need for survival of, of any sort, especially in the market view, uh, right? And mostly uh, marginalized communities and peripheries, but also poor communities and mostly black communities in Brazil are exposed to a situation in which they they don't have access to formal education or formal. Um, um, uh, work in the formal economy, right? So the hustling is also very much associated with the the drug dealing or the or the uh, not not necessarily like the need to work for the drug dealing because this is the only opportunity you have. Um, and I wanted to ask in relation to this, the, with the rise of this very far right uh, discourse that is now in government, now the, the logics of Rio are in Brasilia, and we have. A government that is not only talking about fake news in terms of of its statistics and denying employment statistics, but it's talking about you know Nazism being a phenomenon of the left and talking about you know the coup of '64 that started started 21 years of dictatorship being a um, needed to be celebrated. So I think there is an ideology of militia that is very much in opposed 
opposing, criminalizes the idea of correria in Portuguese. Como que você vê a ideia de, uh, de correria ou a uh, universidade da correria, que aqui a gente tra traduziu como resistência, mas que na verdade tem hoje uma criminalização muito forte. Né? Em Brasília, o discurso dessa ideologia de milícia, que é preciso armar a população e tudo mais, ela vai de direto encontro a, a uma ideologia de correria, de resgatar o orgulho da rua, de se, se virar. Enfim, eu posso formular depois a ideia para você, mas era mais claro. Eu acho que nós vamos ter anos muito difíceis. Muito. Eu, eu acredito que outras pessoas vão morrer. E talvez eu conheça algumas dessas pessoas. Mas eu acho que toda a democracia ou todo o país se constrói com a dor. E eu acho que essa lição a gente precisava passar. E nós precisamos passar pelo que estamos passando agora. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, one time for one more question, I know, and I'm sorry, everybody who's come, thank you very much. I didn't say at the beginning of my oh, panelists in particular, uh, holding a little bit past, uh, past the time to close, but I'm going to turn to the audience now for another uh, final question. Who will hold it, Pete? Anyone? Don't need to be a Brazil expert, by the way, to ask. Any further questions? Maybe I just have one. I recognize Daniela. <laughs> I have one question. I, I, I wanted to go back and maybe ask our social scientists that uh, listen to this and mindful Valley as you are the U.S. experience and you, Rodrigo, of the Brazilian experience. Um, the question I kind of posed to you in, in the very beginning, social policies, race-based interventions, you might call them, to address the concerns that so powerfully Mileni and, and, uh, and Anderson and others in the room here brought to us, the future of those race-based policies, of the future, what what might occur to you, Valerie, listening, you, Rodrigo, knowing Brazil as well as you do, what what are the sorts of policies that might work? We saw Milani give us slide after slide laws that never really became uh, practical. What What is missing, Rodrigo? We'll start with you. Okay. You mean in terms, uh, broadly speaking, in terms of policy design, or this government in particular, what should we expect to happen now? So, take, it, take it any way you want, but I was thinking more broadly, but take it any way you want. So, well, I think it's, uh, I think it's pretty obvious that we should expect some backlash from, from the current government, I think, along several dimensions, not on a race-based policy, but I think with redistributive policies, more generally speaking. I think they throw these little statements here and there, I think, to see the political, the reaction of the, of the public, but I mean, during the campaign, and maybe I think one month ago, again, for instance, they, they throw out something slightly negative about the condition, the Brazilian condition of cash transfer program, Bolsa Familia. I think you'll see these things popping up. I think they're just touching the, the ground to see the political reaction. And I think when they, one of those doesn't face a lot of resistance, they're going to go for it, right? So I think uh, few, if we think of over the next years, I think eventually several of the of the social policies that have been implemented over the last 15 years or so, I think they're going to try to push back. To what extent they're going to be able to do so, I think depends on the political support and on civil society and how civil society is going to react to that, right? And I, I think for now I don't see it happening, but, but time, time changes, right? In terms of, uh, of, uh, of policies to fight inequality among all dimensions, social and racial that I think are extremely highly correlated in Brazil, so they're very intermingled, I think we <coughs> tend to focus a lot on the, on the very, I guess, salient dimensions, like uh, explicitly race-based policies like quotas and so on, and they have played a role, but they have played a role to the top of the distribution of the discriminated minorities, right? I think that most effective long-term policy to fight uh, inequality in Brazil, social and racial-based inequality, is really revamp completely basic education, right? And change priorities in terms of expenditures. So if you take like expenditures per students in the Brazilian education system at the preschooling level, like uh, early childhood and basic educational levels, are extremely low and are actually much lower than we, we spend per, per, per uh, yeah, college student at, at the university level. That is mostly middle, upper middle class students that go even to public uh, schools, right? So I think 
the issue, I mean, if you think about this inequality in the long run, we should really transform basic education in Brazil. I think that would be the, the thing that would deliver really major impact in the, in the long term. I want to go back to your other comments where you said sort of the growth of social security spending, which is terribly the hotly debated topic in Brazil today, prevents some, some of the redirection of resources to basic education. Exactly. Bill Marie, please, maybe you're both. Uh, Tom, can I, can I uh, sit, just do, hang on, I'll get Bill and then we'll, we'll have the final question. Okay. The only thing I was going to add to that is that this struck me while you were talking about the uh, <clears throat> judges in Brazil is that the one answer is that more black, more minority um, judiciary uh, policymakers are needed. But <coughs> what we know as social scientists is that that's not enough because when you wind up being in positions of power, oftentimes you can be susceptible to taking on <coughs> a different view. So just because you put someone who's black in the judiciary, they have to be progressive. They have to remember where they came from. They have to remember what either you know what they stand for uh, with respect to the issues that <coughs> our communities are facing. So one of the things that we know reliably happens is when you put people who are in positions of power, identity isn't enough. Race isn't always enough. Some sometimes it is, but it's not. So. So it's the the push of these like fundamental policies are also needed. It's not just identity. And so this 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 is like just something that I always come back to. Very, very well put. Silvia, uh, and, and uh, you said that others here in the room from the Brazil Seven are very happy to see you all here. Silvia, the final question okay, of the evening. It's not a, I'd like to make a comment, if I may. In my sixty years of research in Brazil. The only time I have ever seen inverse racism was in the Candomblés and Batukis in Rio Grande do Sul. And this is where the descendants of Germans and Italians and Poles go into Afro-Brazilian religions and look to the black members as superior people knowing more. I raise this to say I have never heard the word religion raised in any of the discussions here or in most other places. And I think it may be valuable to look at the religious experience of Afro-Brazilians and build it into the conversation because there are all kinds, and this is particularly at schools and thinking of education and in our discussions because this is an important part of Brazilian culture that's continuously left out by those who want to change Brazil. Thank you. Thank you. I know which is a comment, but we do have a reply, so we'll not okay. Tom, eu posso falar com ele depois desse. Não é, não, não, não precisa. Eu vou ver se eu entendi para poder responder. O senhor afirma que houve um episódio de racismo inverso? Uh, Sim. Uh, ok, ok. Uh, primeiro sobre religião. Ok. Uh, as religiões, elas, eu não sou um especialista. Mas eu acredito que as religiões são fenômenos originalmente tribais. Uh, tendo como exemplo Israel. For example, Israel. O Deus de Israel, of Israel era um Deus. O Deus dos Fenícios era outro Deus. O cristianismo é que talvez, talvez tenha promovido essa internacionalização de Deus. Christianity, Christianity, internationalized the concept of God. 
Isso é uma opinião minha. Eu não sou baseado em nada coisa. Coisa. Apenas uma opinião. Eu acredito que as religiões afro-brasileiras, afro-brasileiras, religiões, são perseguidas. Isso é um fato real. E todas as vezes que as pessoas brancas se aproximam da And every time that white people get close to uh, Afro, uh, uh, Afro religions, African religions, é para ter um olhar exótico sobre elas, to look at them uh, as something exotic, a phenomenon, ou para promover a apropriação cultural, or to promote a cultural appropriation. Pessoalmente, eu não acredito que pessoas brancas devam participar de rituais religiosos. I, I don't believe that uh, white people should participate in uh, Afro Brazilian religious uh, rites. Eu não, não estou sendo radical, porque os judeus não me deixam entrar nessa pergunta. E, e eu respeito os judeus. Eu quero usar o Kipá, eu acho maravilhoso usar o Kipá, mas eu não sou judeu. Então eu também tenho que respeitar as religiões africanas. Eu sou, então eu não posso. Mas é uma opinião. É uma opinião. Eu acredito que é uma opinião de respeito, de respeito para o afro-brasileiro. Ele não se não... Chegou ao ponto, talvez que eu pensei que fosse chegar, de uma repressão da, 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 da religião. Não tem que ter uma palavra aqui. Eu vou abrir um pouco de pequenas palavras, mas é importante. É a perseguição das religiões. Sim, por favor. As afro-religiões no Brasil são grande parte não só de pessoas brancas, não só de pessoas brancas. É uma sorte de religião. Mas isso é uma parte muito importante da nossa cultura and our heritage. And unfortunately, we do have a big uh, deal of uh, persecution now against and uh, discrimination against uh, people from Afro-Brazilian religions. Uh, this is not being addressed properly. Um, in Rio, they just passed a law last year, a uh, state law saying, uh, well, now we have a, uh, different provisions, different procedures for uh, discrimination against uh, uh, religions. But actually, they made it much, much more difficult to, to punish whoever discriminates uh, these, um, these religious people. So uh, since we are in this uh, now new atmosphere, new uh, era in Brazil, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. But for sure, there's a big trouble um, also during, um, inside the black community. Because if you don't, if you if you don't practice this religion, you know this is part of our culture, so it should be respect. Thank you very much. As pessoas, as pessoas brancas não estão preparadas para saber que Jesus é negro. Quanto mais para participar de uma religião afro. It's been wonderful to be with you, and I know I think you all feel the same way. I think what the global centers do in Colombia, uh, thank you all for being. What they try to do is to bring the very best in research at Columbia University and and, and uh, confront that with real world problems in Brazil. I mean, we do a lot, but that's one thing we we've always tried to do. And I thought that tonight's five speakers. Um, it has beautifully, and I would like you to rise with me and thank them all for being with us tonight, and thank you to them. I love them.